Hi everyone. Someone once had said that we could learn what we lack from our dreams. There is a reason each of us are on this earth and our dreams have the power to point us towards that reason. At UST Global, each of us is profoundly aware of this reality as we work passionately with each of you to make a difference to the world around us. In UST Global, we are simply in love with what we do because each of us is aligned to our goal of transforming 3 billion lives through digital technology. Now, I believe that behind such urgent passion is the human mind fired by inspiration and innovation. It is a childlike curiosity and the courage to reject the routine and embrace the new. We simply feel us, so we see things differently, which help us nourish great ideas, not only in us, but in everyone we work with. Therefore, I am truly excited to talk to you about an inspiring thought leadership talk through which each of you will become our innovation partner. We'll watch and listen to a powerful speaker who will help us trigger that idea that lies deep within us waiting to change this world. Collectively, I truly believe that our ideas will one day connect the dots and transform the world. I welcome you to UST Global's Thought Leadership Transformation Talks. I'm positive that what you watch today will inspire you to turn your dreams into reality and remember, we are with you in this journey. Happy listening. I want to welcome all of you um, on behalf of Somos Associate Resource Group um, in, in, in support with our leadership that's here in the room. I want to welcome you to our end of the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. We want to introduce a couple of people that have been strong supporters, not only of the ARGs, but their presence here signifies their commitment to our career development. Um, we have Brian Murray, our COO. Uh, for the government division. Did I get that right? <laughs> uh, we have Amadou, who is our COO for the commercial plan. And we have a couple of different people, Dr. D Sajida Hussein, who is our chief medical officer. Dr. Luis Estevez, also another one of our chief medical officers out in um, the commercial world. And once again, this, this was something that we wanted to put together you know, as, as part of a career development. The organization is committed to investing in, in our careers and in our talent and development. So it is my distinct honor to have our opening remarks delivered by someone who has been not only a mentor, but a strong supporter of me over the five years of my career here at Anthem. For those of you joining us live, um, I, in, I welcome you to also participate by sending your questions to Anthony Thom 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 Thompson. Wow, this is live TV, people. So once again, I want to introduce to you our New York Plan President, um, Jack Stevenson. Well, since this is uh, the end of Hispanic Heritage Month, I think it's fair to say, hola, mi gente. Como están, or as the Dominicans say, como te da? So um, on behalf of Anthem and uh, Somos, the uh, Employee Associate Resource Group, and a special thank you to UST Global for putting this together. I hope you really have taken this time the past month really to celebrate Hispanic culture. You know, my wife's Dominican. Sometimes I understand Spanish, sometimes I don't. Está gritando, entiendo nada. But the, the, uh, the point here is, you know, my son's Dominican and half Irish, very similar to someone in the audience, but half Puerto Rican, half Irish, I think. But, um, it makes it a little more real for me that how important it is to celebrate this month. It's not only the celebration, I think, of I think six or seven countries' independence days, which kicked this off, like Nicaragua, I think El Salvador, Costa Rica, uh, a few others, and then uh, certainly Mexico, uh, but how important this month is to understand the contributions that we all make, and in particular, it, what Hispanics have made to this country and continue to make, and how big of a future they are. You know, five point, what's it, 54 million people? Hispanic descent, uh, most of them are Mexican, by, by Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and Dominicans, but every part of our fabric, every part of our culture is impacted. Whether it's the food we eat, the sports we watch, the, the great doctors, the medicine, the innovation that's coming, it's really important. So I hope you take a lot out of today. I got a great speaker. I saw a couple of his speeches. I'm glad I'm not following him. <laughs> but uh, I'll turn this back over, I guess, to Mariella. Uh, by the way, Mariella is fantastic, and she 
always seems to get me involved in stuff. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I think the last time it was Spanish TV, right? Yes. You know, yes, I actually wrote the speech in Spanish for him. So. Yeah, and I butchered it. No, so I, I think my Spanish is just a tad better than former Mayor Bloomberg, <laughs> who, who tries to say help, help, and he says chicken, you know, pollo, pollo. But, you know, the New Yorkers get that. Well, anyway, across the country, welcome to New York. Welcome to this event. I hope you learned a lot. And again, thank you for UST Global for providing the, the, the technology and the infrastructure to make this possible. Somos and, and any ARG, get involved. They're there to help support you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack. So last night I had the pleasure of doing a dry run with Victor, and I really got to get to know him on a more of a personal level, easy to talk to. So I'm sure that you guys will find his, um, his delivery method very interesting and very enjoyable. So once again, Victor is described as a multifaceted motivational professional. His ta he is a talent of many hats, an engineer, global executive, motivator, author, and an accomplished filmmaker, producer, actor, sales trainer, and financial strategist. Anything you don't do? <laughs> Cook. Without a doubt, <laughs> that's, that's a big skill. Without a doubt, Victor exemplifies the combined power of education, an inquisitive mind, and no excuses work ethic. From a poor upbringing from one of the toughest areas of Chicago, it didn't stop him from earning a degree in electrical engineering, an MBA, and building a 20-year career as a successful global business executive in the high-tech industry. His numerous accomplishments in sales and marketing in the Fortune 500 arena include building a global sales force, establishing contract agreements across languages and cultures, creating financial pricing models, and developing corporate brands, and marketing for worldwide acceptance which led him to become the Vice President of International Sales in a Fortune 500, $3 billion corporation, and subsequently the CEO of a multi-million dollar global technology firm. Victor Antonio has also been an award-winning voice for leveraging diversity, which our company is very um, engrossed and immersed into, hence the diversity that we see in this room. And across my people that are signing in via live stream, the diversity across the nation, um, and has conducted businesses across the nation in Latin America, Europe, Asia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Middle East, United Arab Emirates, and South Africa. He continues to share his experiences and vision and leadership formula through his numerous diversity and sales training programs, books, and keynotes, including the Unleashing the Logic of Success. So please welcome Victor, Victor Antonio, as he presents Unleashing the Logic of Success. First of all, thank you. This is a great way to end Hispanic Month. Why Hispanics started Hispanic Month on September 15th and ended it October 15th? Quien sabe? Who knows? I'm just here. So thank you for having me. To uh, Anthem Group, also Somos, thank you very much for having me here. I appreciate your commitment to success and just sharing the whole message of diversity. I think it always goes beyond race. There's always diversity of ideas as well as what we bring to it. Uh, to our sponsors, UST, thank you very much. 15 years of service. You guys must be doing something right, right? So congratulations and thank you for supporting this talk. I think it's important. And so what I want to talk about today, and I really appreciate being here, is about success. I always get the question. And so, you know, Victor, how did you become successful? How did you go from, because we were born, I was born and raised in Chicago. My family's originally from Puerto Rico. Boricuas in the house, all right, Boricuas. I went to Minnesota and I did that and it was like crickets, right? <laughs> Nothing, right? And so my family's originally from Puerto Rico and they moved to Chicago in the late 50s. And so I always joke that we were poor, 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 poor. Food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk, broke, right? And so my mother was the true motivator in the house, right? And I always joke that my mother, because people always ask me, well, Victor, how did you do it? You know, how did you get through the hood? Drugs, gangs, violence, you know, go to college, get the degree, you know, get an MBA, be successful in business. How'd you do it, Victor? How'd you do it? To which I say, mommy, yeah, right? Because mommy was the motivator, right? And my mother didn't read the books on Dr. Spock, you know, and talk to me in a certain way. I said, no, Victor, this is what you need to do. My mother motivated me with that one tool that every Puerto Rican mother used back in the day. What was that? Look, my people, la chancleta, the sandal. Remember the sandal? Yeah, so right, there's the sandal, right? I know, there were options, there was the switch, right? There was the belt, that was like the nuclear option right there, right? So my mother always had the sandal, right? And my mother had that sandal, the one with the wooden wedge, you remember back in the day? 
They had the rubber on the bottom, but she walked pigeon toed, so it would, you know, basically wear out the rubber so you get that exposed wood. You know what I mean? And so I remember one day, my mother, you know, when you did something wrong, it was like immediate feedback. She was into, she understood B.F. Skinner, right? Immediate feedback is always necessary, right? You know, negative reinforcement, here it is, right? So you did something wrong, she would grab you, she'd lick you up, blah, 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 blah. And she'd always say this, vete a dormir caliente, right? Which means go to bed hot because this thing was really lit up. You know, when she got done with you, she went to bed. As you got older, you started getting smarter, right? Because when you walk into a room, you know that your mother's not in a good mood, right? So I remember one time she's like, I came in late. For those of you who are her old school, I'm gonna test you. When did you know you had to come in? Yes, when the street lights came on, right? As soon as you saw the street light, you're like, ah, oh, I think I'm late. And so you run home, right? You run home, as we say, Chicago, your book, right? You start running home, and then you get home, and I remember I walked into the door, and my mother was standing there, and she had that screw face on that look, you know, and you're like, and she says, Benaki. Uh -oh. Now, come here. And you know when your mother says, come here, that's not good. She goes, Benaki. And without thinking, I go, no. <laughs> Yes, I didn't know, it just came out. It, it's one of the, I wanted to have like a Matrix moment, just stop the movie, Gra <laughs> grab the word and said, look mom, I didn't mean for that to come out, that was a mistake, you know, don't. As soon as she heard no, she, I could hear that Clint Eastwood music in the background. You know that, 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 that spaghetti western, oh, something's about to go down, right? And my mother, when she grabbed the sandal and she unholstered it, because she was like Clint Eastwood, when she, I mean, here's how she unholstered the sandal. You didn't even see it. It was like this. One boot. It was like right there. It was like, it was like right there. So when she said, come here, I said, no. She looked at me, and I knew she was going for the gun, right? The holster. She, right? And I started running. I remember I turned around. I took about two or three steps. By the third step, I heard a whistling sound, a clear indication that the sandal was airborne, right? <laughs> And that thing had like a radar guidance system on it because it would go under the table, around the corner, nothing but head, right? Go to sleep, little Victor, right? But I love my mother, and, but she was always like the motivator, right? So let's give it up for the moms in the room. Come on. Right? Because mothers are the motivators. And the people I say, well, what about fathers? My father, a typical Puerto Rican father, he didn't have to say anything. He just said your name, right? My father had a two-step process. Your name touched the bell. Victor. And what did you do? Did you just freeze no matter what you were doing? Like, you know, that, that's it. So fathers, I love you. So my mother was like, go to school, get the education, get the J-O-B, and it was tough. Now, for those of you who don't understand, I live in Georgia right now. Anybody from Georgia? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Georgia South, I love this South. By the way, we've been there 10 years. I love Georgia, right? But Southern folk may be a little slower sometimes to get it, right? So I remember I moved into the neighborhood of Georgia, right? True story, it's in my movie, The Motivator. So I remember I moved in, bought this beautiful house, right? Bought a crib, acre, nice crib, right? And so I remember this beautiful, I was outside, because I like to do, you know, I got that Protestant work ethic. If I, if, you know, if there's a hedge to be cut, I'm gonna cut the hedge. If there's grass to be mowed, I'm gonna mow, I'm not gonna pay somebody to do it. it. Makes no sense to me. You ever have people take their car in to get washed, join the gym, and then pay somebody to do their lawn? Look, do the lawn, Get the exercise, wash your own car, get some more exercise. Trust me, you'll save a lot of money that way, right? So I'm out there with my shorts, my t-shirt, my sandals, and I'm just trimming the hedge. All of a sudden, this beautiful 700 series BMW pulls up. The guy hits the button, bam, window comes down, leans over. He says, hi. Now, I'm in Georgia, I learned. When in Rome, do as the Roman. So I looked at him and I said, hi, <laughs> just like that. You should see when I talk Puerto Rican with, this, with a southern accent, that's fascinating. So he says, hi, I said, hi. He says, real slowly, he goes, do you know who lives here? And I said, oh, heck no. <laughs> he thinks I'm the gardener. <laughs> to which I said, you know, and I said something, you know, so at that point I just decided just, you know, go into my Tony Montana accent. Joe, man, let me tell you, some real nice people live here, okay? <laughs> and so he turned out to be one of the nicest neighbors I have, but George is different. And I always get the question is, you know, Victor, do you need a green card to be here? I get, I get, this is true, I do not lie. And when people ask me, do I need a green card, what do I say? What do I say? Yes! It's called the American Express. Don't leave home without it. That's the only green card you need in this world, right? But I have to explain to that Puerto Rico is a 
Commonwealth of the United States. You know, people are like, really? Right, really? And so let me give you the history of Puerto Rico, because I dig it, right? So I'm gonna give you what I call the thumbnail history of Puerto Rico, okay? Indians on the island, chilling, just doing their thing, right? Nothing's happening. All of a sudden, Europeans come over. Eh, things don't go well, mm, not well, right? So all of a sudden, a lot of people die, right? So all of a sudden, the black slave trade begins, right? And so you have this mixture. So you can go to our family reunion, and you'll see a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Puerto Rican, or you'll see a darkest midnight Puerto Rican. You can't tell. We got the spectrum. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, because you know what that means? Do you know what that means, that I'm Puerto Rican? That means I can talk about anybody in this room, and you can't get mad at me. Because <laughs> I'm one-third white, one-third black, and one-third Puerto Rican. And by the way, just to be totally all inclusive in here, did you also know that we also brought in Irish and Asian, especially Chinese? Yeah, we got it all. So we are like we are it, you know what I mean? And so it's interesting because I've always viewed it that way. Early on when I was in the neighborhood in Chicago, it was very interesting because we were living near Humble Park, Cabrini Green housing projects. A lot of drugs, a lot of violence, right? And our neighborhood was typically half black, half Hispanic. And then we had a couple of white people. Right? Like white owls, spotted owls. Like once you saw one, you're like, whoa, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> there weren't that many, right? They're like, wow. So we're like, don't mess with the white people. We don't have that many. Please protect them, right? <laughs> we don't have that many. And so, so it was interesting. But when I was in that neighborhood, you would always hear that success was always for other people. Whites have it better. Whites have it better. Whites have it better, right? Fast forward my life, I go to college, right? Why did I go to college? What do you, why do you think I went to college? Why do you think I got an engineering degree? Yell it out, don't be afraid. Because huh? my mom told me, that is so right, you were listening. What was the second reason? Your father touched this belt. Touched this belt, yes. Let's get past the family stuff. What was my motivating reason to go to college? Money! Yeah. Come on, can we just be simple for a second? Yeah. You guys are so complicated. Well, I don't know, they just strategically, I think you should. No, money! At that point, you want to what? We got to pay bills, right? So I remember I go to school, decided to get an engineering degree. Why an engineering degree? Money. Money! Right? Because they, I heard, I said, how much do they make? Ooh, that's a lot of money. Let's go there. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I know you wanted a complex thought process that I went through, but no, it was that simple, right? <laughs> and so I remember I decided to go to Illinois Institute of Technology on 35th and State in Chicago, right? And so I remember that that was for the first time that I left the neighborhood. Now I am in a new place called the university. And all of a sudden, I am now faced with people from all over the world. We're talking, especially whites, we're talking, you know, from Africa, we're talking from Latin American, because all Latin Americans, Hispanics are not all the same people, right? So, you know, it's like, aren't you Hispanic? Yes. Do I understand Chileans and Argentinians? No, nobody does, <laughs> right? <laughs> I just offended a couple of people in here. I know, but I'm only kidding. But in other words, we're all different. And so all of a sudden you start meeting people from Asia, right? Japan, China, whatever. And all of a sudden, there's this new exposure. And that is the first time I had what I call the anthropological term, culture shock. I really understood what that meant. Because now I was out of the bubble, and now I was like facing this milieu of people, different races, different backgrounds. And in college, my best friend, his name was Mike. Mike was white. Mike was poor. And I said, Mike, why are you poor? You're white. <laughs> <laughs> to which Mike said, what are you, an idiot? Because <laughs> no, in my head, in my head, what did I have? The script, the narrative, right? Let me ask you a question. What is the poorest population in the United States? In terms of numbers, not percentage. In terms of number, what is the poorest population in that state? Hold that thought. Second question, who uses welfare the most? In terms of population, not percentage, what race? So what was the answer to both? Whites. See, people are like, what? Whites? Yes. More people who are poor under poverty are white. And also, the majority of people who use welfare are white. What happens is they can combine all the minorities, which makes it a bigger share. So I want to talk about the white problem. You know, <laughs> I tell people, let's talk about the white problem. They're like, what, what, what white problem? And again, just that simple fact, all of a sudden, these glasses that I thought start to shatter, these illusions that I had, these what I call fundamental attribution errors. 
A fundamental attribution error is basically when you look at something and you think it is what it is, but it really isn't. And the more you learn, the more you see, the more you get it. See, because I, I, I come from a philosophy of transcending race. I think we're either Americans or human beings. Take your pick, those are the only two boxes I'm giving you, right? Because I come from that space. Because to be successful, it's okay to understand diversity. I get that part. That's what makes this kind of cool, right? This whole melting pot kind of cool. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings trying to just live a very nice life. Can I get a yes on that one, yeah? yeah that's all we're trying to do. That's all we're trying to do. And so, you know, when people ask me about success, what I want to do is share with you just some of the things I went through when I went through corporate America. Because to me, when I went through college, that was like the first, what I call the first tectonic shift. Like, okay, that, I had a lot of things wrong. And then when I got into corporate America, I even had more things wrong. And sometimes, and I'm gonna say this, and I say this with a loving way, sometimes we carry a chip on our shoulder, right? And we think that everybody's got it out for us. And one of the things I see often is people say, well, you know, I'm not accepted in this culture. When I'm in corporate America, I'm different. And I'm to, to which I say, shut up, just shut up. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So I'm working in corporate America, and all of a sudden, everybody's going golfing. But they don't invite the Puerto Rican kid. <laughs> Which kind of makes sense from a logical standpoint. We just didn't have a lot of greens in the hood. <laughs> right? Well, there was Cabrini Green, but that was it, right? <laughs> and so at first, there's two ways to take that. They're excluding me. They don't like me, because I'm Puerto Rican, <laughs> right? But then I said, Maybe I should learn how to play golf. And so what did I do? Got some sticks, go took some lessons, learned how to play golf. I learned how to speak the language. Birdie, par were no longer strange phrases to me. I understood front nine, back nine. I understood what sticks you use in certain places. All of a sudden, I began speaking the language, and then something funny happened one day. Hey, Victor, you want to go golfing with us? Yeah. See, sometimes there's another example of a fundamental attribution error. It isn't that you're being excluded, it's just that there's a group that does a particular thing and unless you're doing that, you're not going to get invited. And I want you to, that's the first step, is there a, to be aware of sometimes we attribute something to something that isn't there. Stephen Covey many years ago wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Everybody read that? Yes. It's a great book. In there is a perfect example of a fundamental attribution error. And in there there's this guy, he's sitting on the train. He's, he's sitting on the train, he's on the train looking outside the window. Train's going, moving along. His three kids are bouncing all over the place, basically disturbing the other passengers. Bouncing all over the place, disturbing the other passengers. Finally, this lady has the nerve to go up to the man and says, excuse me, sir, but do you know that your kids are bothering all the passengers on the actual train? Well, he had to break the guy's concentration because he was so focused on looking outside the train. He looked at her and said, oh, he said, excuse me? And she said it again. He goes, he goes, I'm really sorry. She goes, I didn't realize that. My wife just died their mother, and I don't know how to tell them. Did you feel the shift? You went from, that guy is so irresponsible. He really doesn't pay attention to his kid. What a bad father, too. Wow, now you're simple, right? I didn't need to, right? You're more sympathetic, right? I didn't know, right? And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we look at something and project something that really isn't there. And I think that's the first step. Sometimes we get offended for no reason. You know what I mean? Stop being offended so easily. Nobody's here to offend anybody. And if there is a misunderstanding, let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it. For some reason, political incorrectness has almost rendered us voiceless, if that makes any sense. Everybody's trying to be so politically correct. I get that. Let's not be rude. But at the same time, why can't we just talk? Right? It's simply, why can't we just talk? And so one of the stories I have as far as being successful is that sometimes you really have to take action. Would you agree with that statement? In your mind, you have something. So many years ago, I heard this story. There's a man walking down the road, right? He's been walking down the road for a long time, and he's real thirsty. In the distance, he sees a farmhouse, right? And he wants to drink of water. So he approaches the farmhouse, and on the porch, there's an old man sitting in a rocking chair, just rocking back and forth, just rocking back and forth. And right next to that old man is a big old nasty hound dog going, <laughs> right, just laying there, right? So finally, the man approaches the house and says, excuse me, sir, do you mind if I get a drink of water? I've been walk, walking a long distance. Can I please have a drink of water? Old man goes inside the house, absolutely, to get the drink of water. But in the meantime, all you hear is the dog going, what? <laughs> so finally, the old man comes out, hands the stranger a drink of water. They're having a conversation. And as they're having a conversation, he's sipping his water. What do you hear in the background? 
<laughs> Finally, the stranger can't take it anymore. Says the old man, excuse me, sir, but why is your dog making that sound? Old man gets back in the rocking chair. They well, looks at the dog, looks at the stranger, looks at the dog, looks at the stranger, said, he's laying on attack. That's why he's making that sound, because he's laying on attack. The stranger doesn't know what to say, so he doesn't want to be asked too many questions. He keeps drinking water. But in the background, all you hear is what? <laughs> finally, the stranger goes, that's it. I got to ask. I got to ask. You ever had that moment where you go, I got to ask. I got to ask. So finally, he says, excuse me, sir. But if that dog is laying on attack, why doesn't it get up? Old man looks at the stranger, looks at the dog, back at the stranger, says, it's real simple. The attack hurts the dog, but not enough to make him want to get up and do something about it. Right? Now, let me tell you why that's important for many reasons. Because sometimes when we walk through this building or any building, corporate America, do you always hear that one person complaining? <laughs> I wish they changed the policy. <laughs> I wish management would understand my needs. <laughs> I wish the COO would give us this application. It would make life so much easier. <laughs> Damn, Jack, change that. <laughs> That's all you do. But unless you get up and what? Do something, nothing happens. See, everybody here has a suggestion. Everybody here has a great idea, right? Oh, I know. I could talk to the COO and I can make it. Yeah, I know you have a great idea. But have you ever gotten up and done something about it? Did you ever get up and put a proposal in somebody's hand, as opposed to just going in there and complaining? We all heard this story about the guy that walks into the boss's office, right? Says, look, I got a complaint. Gives him, because he wrote it out. Took time to actually write it out. Boss turns over the piece of paper and there's nothing on the back side. He says, it's incomplete. Because if you're going to come in here with a problem, you also better have a what? <laughs> right? And that's it sometimes. Sometimes we all, look, we can all look at any company and just really rip it up in terms of what it needs to do in terms of improvement. But unless you get up and actually help, you're not helping at all. See, I believe success is about ABC. It's that simple. Sorry, there's the magical equation for success. Ready? Your attitude will drive your behavior. Your behavior will drive the consequences. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Your attitude will always drive your behavior. If you walk in with a bad attitude, your behavior will reflect that. And then something bad things will begin to happen. You won't get the raise. You won't be recognized. You won't be included in the group. And you say, see? And it feedback, just like a feedback loop, it feeds the behavior again. Once you shift your behavior, once you change your behavior, once that attitude shifts, your behavior, what you do changes. See, you don't determine your success. You do not determine your success. You determine your habits, and then your habits will determine your success. It's what you do. When you have the right attitude, what habits do you implement every day? What habits do you implement? And that's the key, because everybody in here has a good idea, right? But sometimes we're afraid, right? Now, we're always what? Afraid to do something new. I remember years ago, my wife, I got, by the way, Wife, two kids, I've been married now 27 years. Nice. <laughs> and I have two kids, right? Boy and a girl, right? So one day my wife says, we're going on vacation. Now, for any smart man in here who's married, when your wife says we're going on vacation, fellas, what are we doing? Pack. Pack, you're going on vacation, right? I said, where are we going? We're going to do a cruise in the Caribbean. All right, so first port of call, we get to Mexico, right? My daughter, AKA the great one, the love of my life. That's right. The great one says to me, I want to go back horseback riding on the beach. Now, when the great one wants to go horseback riding on the beach, as a father, what are you going to do? Horseback riding on the beach. That's what you do, right? Then we get to, I think it was Belize, no, Guatemala. My son wants to go ATV in the forest. That's sure, let's do that. We go ATV in the forest. We finally get to Belize. My wife says, let's go on a zip lining tour. Now, raise your hand if you know what that is. Right? I didn't know. If you don't know what it is, for those of you that are I didn't know what it was. She goes, it's basically tree, tree, wire. You know, you hang on, right? Now, I've been married how many years? Right, she knows I'm afraid of heights. But she made it sound like this. This is what women do, especially wives. No, no, it's not that bad. They're like two small trees. Not a big deal, not a big deal. So I remember we drive with the Jeep, we get there, and I remember looking up, and these trees are over 100 feet tall, and people are zipping, and they look that small. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing this. I'm not, no, I'm not doing this. I'm gonna do, I'm not doing this, right? I'm not doing this. And all of a sudden, my little girl, <laughs> the great one, <laughs> looks up at me with those beautiful big eyes and says that one word that would melt any father's heart, which is, yes. now, she goes, sissy, <laughs> right? <laughs> 
I'm from the hood. I raised my girl hard, right? <laughs> she goes, sissy. I go, what did you say? She goes, sissy. I sissy. Sissy. Now, fellas, when your girl calls you a sissy, what you gonna do? It's time to man up, right? So I said, all right, I'll do this, I'll do this. And so what they do is they give you a harness system with a pulley system, right? And so sure enough, the guy gives me these instructions, right? Now imagine us, all four on the platform, right? He says, all right, here's how it works. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put pulley system, right? And you're gonna hold your hand like that, right? Now, he says, what you're gonna do in your right hand, they give you a glove with a piece of rawhide like leather right there. The man says, that's your braking system. <laughs> he says, here's what you do. He says, you're gonna grab the pulley. You're gonna go that way, right? He says, when you're gliding, he says, what you wanna do is let your hand ride on top of the cable. He says, now listen carefully. Listen real carefully, he says. He says, when you start, when you jump off the platform, you're gonna pick up speed. He says, especially when you get to the middle, you're gonna pick up a lot of speed. He says, but you're also gonna see the other tree. So what you need to do is slow down. And what you do is you go tap, tap, tap. He said, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not try to grab the wire and stop out in the dime. Your arm will come out of its socket. <laughs> to which I say, dude, too much info, right? Like, ah. And so sure enough, it's our turn. There we are, visualize it. Us four on the platform. I left my wife and kids go first because that's what real men do, right? <laughs> so, all right. Don't judge me. Don't, don't judge me. Don't judge. By the way, I, I am just fi following societal norms. Societal norms says women and children. That's all I'm saying. So they went first, and so sure enough, it's my turn. Now, I don't know if I jumped off or he pushed me off. I like to think I jumped off. It was pure volition. I jumped off, right? But sure enough, I remember I started zipping, right? And I shouldn't have let my son go first because he's got the video camera on the other side watching this because it's beautiful. And I remember going through there and then I get to the middle, you start picking up speed and the guy said, don't look down. Whatever you do, Victor, don't look down. You ever tell your brain something and it does the exact opposite? I said, don't look down. And all of a sudden I can feel yesterday's lunch come up like, oh, that tasted nice, right? And so I remember I was flailing. I mean, you had to see it. I'll show you pictures. I will not show you the videos. They're too disturbing, ah, right? And so I remember I get to the other platform and I thought it was just like one zzz. Right? No, they had like a chain of zzz, 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 zzz. <laughs> And I'm just like struggling through this whole thing. But here's the cool part. After I survived that thing, right? I remember on the way out, they gave me a shirt. Everybody gets a shirt. You got the company logo on the front, but on the back, listen carefully, it said something important. It said, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Isn't that a beautiful statement? Yes. My challenge to you is, when was the last time you tried something for the first time? See, too often we get caught up in this comfort zone. We don't want to try something new. At the end of the year, December will come around. Many of you will make a whole long list of things that you're going to do. Can I challenge you to do one thing? I challenge you to pick one thing, and that's the one thing you implement. We were talking at breakfast this morning, and I, I believe in personal accountability, personal responsibility, and personal training. By that I mean every day to this day, I still read two to three books a month. That's who I am, right? If you want to discover something new, if you want to learn, then that's how you do it. That's how you become better. It's a continuous process of just learning, but you have to take accountability for it. You know, too often I hear employees say, well, the company doesn't provide that training. I don't care, because I'm gonna go get that training. One way or another, I can find that training. So there's no excuse for not growing and learning within the company. Now, here's what's gonna happen. Like the hound dog, you're gonna get up. But I said, all right, I'm gonna do something. And then you're gonna overcome your fear, right? You're gonna overcome your fear, right? Like, I'm gonna do something for the first time. And are you gonna feel pressure? Is it gonna succeed the first time? First time out of the gate, do you think you'll succeed? Yes or no? Absolutely not. So, I'll tell you a quick story, and I'm gonna wrap up with this. My first job out of college, I was working for Honeywell. Honeywell, company, Honeywell. How many are familiar with the movie Hunt for Red October? Raise your hand. Yeah, remember that? So if you don't know the movie, here it is. Synopsis, thumbnail again. Right, Russian sub, US sub, shooting torpedoes at each other. Not nice, right? And so I worked on the Mach 46, Mach 50 torpedo system. And it works in a very fascinating way. Here's what they do. They launch the torpedo from a boat or drop it from a helicopter. As soon as it hits the water, it activates. And then it goes into a circular pattern. It begins what they call the hunt mode. All of a sudden, the sonar system turns on. That boom, you ever hear that ping? Here, you do it. One more time. That was so bad. So, so, so of the way the sonar system works is that it emits a sound, the sound will bounce off an object, 
and what will be reflected back is the outline of that object. Everybody with me? So the sonar system turns on, it goes into a circular pattern. And ping, 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 and it goes, ah, I think I found it, the, to the, the submarine. So it moves in that direction, pings, assesses, I think it's it. Ping, assesses, I really think it's it. Ping, assesses, it's not underwater rock formation, not what I'm looking for. It breaks off the attack, goes back into a hunt mode again. Ping, 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 and then it goes, ah, I think I found it. It's in that direction. Now it moves off in that direction. Ping, 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 ah, school of fish, not what I'm looking for. It breaks off the attack again. It'll go after that whale. You don't want to hit a whale with the torpedo. Overkill, right? <laughs> but what happens is the torpedo will go through many iterations before it finds its what? Target. Target. But here's what's interesting. The torpedo has something called artificial intelligence. It's a software design that's very fascinating. When it goes after something and it isn't what it wants, it updates what they call its heuristics, its programming. It says if it looks like that, moves like that, don't go after it, right? It learns. Then it goes after something again. And when it isn't what it wants, it updates the programming again and it learns. It gets smarter until it finally hits its what? Target. Because that's what learning is. That's what any type of endeavor will be. Too often people go after something and it doesn't work out the first time and then what do they say? I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. I'm not good at this, right? Personally they'll say, I'm stupid, I'm not good at this. From a permanent standpoint, things will never change. Why even try again? From a pervasive standpoint, no matter what I try, nothing ever works for me. So why even try? There was a number that came out many years ago that 78% of the population is either unhappy or rather be doing something else. Let me say it again. 78% of the population is either unhappy or rather be doing something else. I submit to you what happens is the following. Here's the visual. Much like a torpedo, they go after something. And when it isn't what they want, what do most people do? They stop. They criticize themselves. I'm not smart. I'm not good enough. Well, you know what? And then they rationalize. Oh, what a dangerous word in corporate America. Rationalize. You know how people rationalize? Well, I'll just do this for now. I'll just do this for a year. I'll just do this because I need the money now. I'll just wait for management to change their mind. I'll just wait for the COO to get hit by a truck and maybe things will really change around here. That was a joke. That was a joke. Do you know what I mean? But they sit there and rationalize for whatever reason. And what happens? You ever, you ever break the word rationalize apart? The ability to rationalize to ourselves. Because isn't that what we do? We talk to ourselves. Listen to this number. 60% of what you worry about never comes to pass. 20% of what you worry about is in the past, so who cares? 10% of what you worry about, even if it came to pass, wouldn't impact you. Your remaining 10% would impact you, you wouldn't kill you. I'll say it slow because I want you to get the numbers. 60% of what you worry about never comes to pass. 20% of what you worry about is in the? So why worry about it? That's 80% of what you worried about. 10% of what you worry about, even if it came to pass, Again, wouldn't impact you. The remaining 10, if it impacted you, wouldn't what? Kill you. We worry so much about failing that we don't do anything. Does that make sense? Because I really want you to understand that. That first of all, step number one in the logic of success is you gotta get up and take action. Second is, you gotta try something new. And last but not least, if you go after something, it isn't what you want, it doesn't work out, then you adjust, you learn from the process, and you try it again until you finally get it. That is the only way that this company as a whole will grow. Does that make sense, yes or no? Yes. On that note, I want to thank you for your time. I know I only have limited time. I know it's a bummer to see me go. Thank you very much.